three, two, one. Hi everyone and welcome to the um, ACIGS May 2020 webinar. Um, I'll just go through the introduction very quickly and we have a very interesting presentation today. So you're aware of the IGS, International Geosynthetic Society and uh, Australasian chapter. Um, so we've gone through these slides before so you're, you're aware of um, benefits of becoming a ACIGS member. Uh, we hold events such as webinars and seminars and also you get free access to uh, Geosynthetics International and Geotextile and Geomembrane journals as part of your membership. Um, a quick link to the IGS website, um, geosyntheticssociety.org and also to ACIGS website. Uh, www.acigs.org and as you can see you can access lots of um, technical resources through both um, IGS and ACIGS websites um, as a member of the society. Um, as part of these technical resources you will get access to um, all of the recordings of the um, previous lectures um, and also the webinars that we've had so far. Um, I have to say this again, that the recording of the webinar, including this webinar, will be, will be uploaded to our website after the webinar. So you can access the recording from the website. Final membership renewal deadline for this year is uh, end of May. So make sure if you haven't renewed yet, um, just renew through our website again. Um, 31st of May is a deadline for the membership and today's webinar is uh, brought to you by um, our sponsor Autofill Geomembranes uh, so thanks to Autofill for sponsoring this webinar and uh, you will have a, a very short presentation after John's presentation uh, today. The topic of the webinar today is periodic table of geomembranes and it's being presented by Dr. John Shears. A quick introduction of uh, Dr. John Shears. Uh, so John is a principal consultant at Excel Plus uh, Polymer Testing Services specializing in testing and analysis of polymers and geosynthetics. John holds a Bachelor of Science in Applied Chemistry from University of Melbourne 1987 and also a PhD in Applied Chemistry from University of Melbourne in 1991. He has over 50 scientific publications in international journals as well as six encyclopedia chapters on polymers, plastic recycling and coatings. He is a member of the editorial board of International Journal Polymer Degradation and Stabilization, Elsevier Scientific, uh, Netherlands. And you see some of the um, uh, books that um, John has authored. So he has, he is the author of several books, including the leading book on polymer failure entitled uh, Compositional and Failure Analysis of Polymers, published by Wiley in England 2000, and also the author of the leading book of plastic recycling entitled uh, polymer Recycling Science, Technology and Applications, published by Wiley in England, 1998. Thank you, John, and uh, over to you for your interesting presentation. Thank you, Mac. I will just... Uh... Okay. Now, Simak, to share the screen, I have to obviously. I still get. Ah, here we go. That's good. That's a good sign. Yep. Okay, that should be visible now, which I'm yes. very relieved. <laughs> All right, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, we'll be covering a systematic approach to understanding geomembranes today. Um, there are a number of types of uh, geomembrane barrier systems, uh, what we call polymeric liner, liners, and we're looking at classifying those in a systematic 
way so that we understand how the property relationships follow the particular groups of liners and how the properties change as we move from one group to another. And we're leveraging off the periodic table of elements, a well-known system of classification of elements. So I'm gonna take you back to uh, first year university or even earlier. We're gonna look at the periodic table of elements first as a, as a way of understanding how we can classify geomembranes. So the periodic table of elements is obviously arranged in groups. They're the vertical columns and the periods then move from left to right. These groups have been color coded because we can look at the various groups and identify similar properties and reoccurring chemical trends within the one group. Now the two columns on the left, those are reactive metals. You'll probably remember from the early days of throwing sodium in water. Uh, they're alkali metals or alkali earth metals. And because of the outer shell electrons, they're reactive. And the trend as we go down is that the electronegativity decreases, which means the distance between the outer valence shell electrons and the nucleus increases and the properties change. They become more reactive. As we move across the table, we go through some of the uh, transition metals in purple there. And then we move towards metalloids and non-metals. And those are analogous to our hybrid composite materials in geosynthetics, uh, where we've got both polymer and perhaps inorganic material or a uh, bituminous material. So those are the non-metals uh, or the, um, the, what we call the mixed, mixed materials, the hybrids. Then as we move to the extreme left, we have the noble gases in red there, which are known for their non-reactive nature and also known as inert gases. And so we have some membrane equivalents in that space. So that's an, a very brief overview. Now I take you to the periodic table of geomembranes, which I've adapted to fit onto the periodic table of elements. So just in very broad view, across the top, we have the commodity space, the engineering space, and then the high performance liners. As we look at the left column there, the first column in green and the second column in blue, those are the polyolefins, and notably polyethylene, polypropylene, and linear low density polyethylene and EVA. Those uh, are commodity liners. They're, they're widely used, they're, uh, they're well known, and hence they're in the commodity space. They also are very cost effective. As we move to the right, the purple column there, we have the vinyls. They're all PVC based, still within the commodity space. Moving further right, we have the urethanes, both thermoplastic urethane as well as thermoset polyurea. Now we're moving more into the engineering based properties of these, these higher performance liners. The next column in green are the rubbers, thermosets, notably EPDM and Hyperlon or CSPE. Next column we have the Composites, also known as hybrids, bituminous geomembranes, the cementitious liners um, in terms of both the in situ hydration and the prefabricated version. And finally, on the extreme right in the light blue, we have the analogous uh, group of inert materials to the inert gases. And these are in fact fluoroplastic liners, which are chemically inert. So they share the same non-reactivity. So that's a very brief overview of the, the trends we see. As we move down the first column, we're decreasing crystallinity. And of course, HDPE, which is in the top left, the most common geomembrane, the one that everybody would automatically think of when we talk about polymeric geomembranes, polyethylene, high density polyethylene, 
is a carbon backbone flanked by hydrogen atoms. So very straight chains and indeed hydrogen is the side group and that's why it occupies that position in this table where hydrogen would be in the periodic table of elements. Because of its linearity and its tight packing, it has very high crystallinity. And that confers properties such as chemical resistance, but it also confers properties such as stiffness and susceptibility to stress cracking. As we move down that first column, crystallinity decreases because the side branching or the side groups are getting progressively longer and they push the chains apart and hence the crystallinity reduces, flexibility increases. The same with the second column. Polypropylene has a methyl group which forces the chains apart and therefore lower crystallinity, higher flexibility. As we move to the vinyls, PVC of course has a chlorine atom on its backbone and that chlorine atom hanging down from the main chain pushes the chains apart even further, chlorine having a quite a large atomic radius. And hence the vinyls are non-crystalline. They're, they're known as amorphous, very little crystallinity, if any. The same with the urethanes, crystallinity is absent. Um, thermoplastic urethanes may have some zones of crystallinity, but it's not regarded as being semi-crystalline. Further across that we have the rubbers, of course, they lack any crystallinity. They're highly pliable and, and amorphous, but, but cross-linked, being thermosets. And then crystallinity ceases to, uh, to have any relevance when we come to the composites or the hybrids. So moving into the first most well-known polymer, high-density polyethylene, I should point out that within the symbol box on the left, the two numbers there, the first number is the melting point and the second number is the density. And that nomenclature follows through for the other symbols as well. In the middle of the screen, we have the advantages. Uh, these are summarized advantages, of course. So polyethylene has excellent broad chemical resistance to a host of chemicals. It's relatively inexpensive, being probably the most affordable geomembrane at about $6 Australian per square meter. It has an excellent track record, having been used for decades. It's available in very wide rolls, wide width, so that reduces seaming eight, up to eight meters. And here's the thing, when properly formulated, you can expect long life, but the longevity of HDPE liners is purely a function of the stabilizer package. The better the antioxidants and stabilizers, the longer the life. Now, polyethylene and the other polyolefins occupy the first two columns in my periodic table because they are reactive and they're reactive to free radical oxidation, free radical attack, and hence the need for additives to retard and, and delay that free radical attack. Looking at the structure on the bottom right, you can see those hydrogens which are connected to the carbon backbone, they, they're easily abstractable. If a free radical comes along, it will remove those protons, create another free radical, and then a chain reaction will start. So that is one of the limitations of polyolefins. It can be engineered around through formulation uh, with appropriate additives. On the right, next to the red button, to the right of the red button, we have the limitations, shortcomings, and drawbacks. Most of these are well known. So the high crystallinity of polyethylene, HDPE, gives it high stiffness. So it can be difficult to install because it is stiff and not pliable. It doesn't conform well to um, subgrades that aren't well, pre well prepared by a compaction. It has poor dimensional stability, meaning it has a high degree of thermal expansion. So in the sun, you will get wrinkles, you will get folds. Now there's ways to obviate that using white surface membrane, which will reduce that thermal expansion by about half. It also has a low strain property. That is the, the, the elongation at strain is quite low, 12%. Once you reach 12%, 
you will get thinning and therefore that's really the practical limit. Its drain capability is limited to about 12%, which is quite low. Along with the high crystallinity and the low strain capability comes stress cracking, which you would have definitely heard of, environmental stress cracking, and hence the polyethylene needs to be well chosen through the, in terms of the structure to reduce stress cracking, but nevertheless, all polyethylenes, particularly high density polyethylenes are susceptible to stress cracking. It's just a question of time, timeline. The crystallinity also gives it a low multi-axial tensile elongation, only about 15%. That's, that's under differential uh, strains. And hence it doesn't cope well with differential sediment. As a consequence of all those above properties, it cannot be prefabricated. So it has to be field welded or field seamed because it can't be folded without damage. And finally, as I said earlier, it's reactive to free radical oxidation, as are all polyolefins. Now, a property I haven't talked about there, but which is relevant in very cold climates, is embrittlement due to, due to extreme cold temperatures. Now, we're talking extreme cold less than minus 35 Celsius or even colder. Here we see a geomembrane liner that's effectively shattered via rapid crack propagation. And that's a consequence of the high crystallinity of HDPE. In these extreme cold applications and climates, you would be better off using something like an EPDM or a bituminous liner, which has far better resistance to, to cold. Now I spoke about broad chemical resistance. HDPE is well known not to have any solvents at room temperature, but it is attacked and it is swollen by chemicals, mainly solvents, that have similar compositional structure to the polyethylene chain. Benzene, diesel, petrol, gasoline. It is attacked by aromatic solvents and it can be swelled. So there are some limitations on its chemical resistance. Now, Looking at the left here, we have high density PERT, PERT standing for polyethylene with raised temperature resistance. It's a relatively new polyethylene where the molecular architecture of the chain has been polymerized in such a way, if you look at the bottom left there, that the, the distribution of chains is bimodal as opposed to a single normal distribution. Now looking at the next slide or next uh, graphic insert in the middle, you'll see that on the higher end of the distribution, the molecular weight distribution, we have more comonomer, more branching than we do at the lower end. And this gives the polyethylene particular uh, properties with regards to resisting deformation at high temperatures. So this type of uh, resin when made into a membrane can handle about 100 degrees as opposed to 80, 80 degrees or less for a conventional polyethylene. It has all the same properties of broad chemical resistance. It has improved stress cracking due to its molecular architecture. And also because of extensive research in the last few years, it has good stabilization packages. Nevertheless, oxidative attack is still possible and hence the need for for proper, proper testing, proper evaluation, what we call immersion testing before using it. Now this PERT liner, uh, which is bimodal, uh, is, is ideal for brine ponds, um, reactive landfills that may run hot, um, geothermal ponds, tailings dams in, in arid climates, those sorts of applications. I should have pointed out that the Melting point is still 132, which is the same as normal polyethylene, HDPE, but its softening point is much higher. Going down that column, we now have high density with a gas barrier, high density polyethylene with what's called ethylene vinyl alcohol, which is shown in the bottom right, the structure. The ethylene vinyl alcohol has a hydroxy side group, an OH side group, which makes it very polar. Because it's polar, it becomes a good barrier 
to non-polar chemicals like uh, your benzene, toluene, xylenes, like methane, and also trichloroethylene, perchloroethylene, laundry, laundry solvents, dry cleaning solvents, I should say. And so this liner now has good gas barrier properties and makes it ideal for landfills, for containing methane, biogas digesters, etc. On the right hand side there, it still has the limitations of high temperature use and it still has poor dimensional stability. All those are legacies of the high density polyethylene geomembrane. And it's still reactive to free radical attack. So again, stabilization system is important. Moving down that column further, we have linear low density polyethylene. On the bottom right, you can see the structure. There's the main chain and we have rather long side branches. Those side branches, which are occasional, serve to keep the chain separated and hence the density is dropped. The density is now 0.94 and the melting point is lower. What this means is that it's a far more flexible material than HDPE. It conforms better to uneven subgrade. It can handle differential settlements such as in landfill caps. However, it comes at the expense of lower chemical resistance than high density polyethylene because opportunistic chemicals can now permeate between those chains which are further apart. It also has lower oxidative resistance than HDPE and is more susceptible to chlorine attack, chlorine being a strong oxidant, and also susceptible to what we call low LSI water, low Langelier saturation index water. So that, that can lead to failure in certain applications with RO water, with chlorine, etc. Moving down further, we now have very low density polyethylene. Notice the density has now dropped to 0.92. Melting point has also dropped further. We now have a very flexible material with a higher yield strain of about 30 to 40%. So it can handle differential settlement much better than HDPE. But because the chains are further apart again, because the density is lower, it is susceptible, more susceptible to oxidative attack, especially from chlorine, and more susceptible to UV attack. And the additive packages developed for this material just can't protect it for the long term, owing to its higher uh, amorphous nature, lower crystallinity. I should have pointed out though, that one of the other Achilles heels of uh, polyolefins is stress cracking. Now this material as well as the linear load, low density are resistant to stress cracking because their crystallinity is proportionally less than HDPE. So that is an advantage as we move down the, the, uh, the column and crystallinity decreases. The other thing I need to point out at this juncture is that these liners are available both in unreinforced and reinforced uh, where there's a scrim support in the, in the middle of the liner. When you reinforce a liner, you improve the tear resistance, but at the expense of elongation and vice versa. In an unreinforced liner, whether it be a polyolefin or even a vinyl liner or a rubber, if you use a scrim, your tear resistance will improve, but your elongation or extensibility will decrease to whatever the scrim is. And the scrim won't have much elongation properties at all. Brings me to flexible polypropylene. Now we've reduced the crystallinity from high density poly, pro, polyethylene from about 55% down to about five to 10% for flexible polypropylene. That is, if we look at the structure on the, on the right hand side, we now have a methyl group on every second carbon. The methyl group being bulky, having what we call a high level of steric hindrance will maintain a separation between those backbone chains. That reduces crystallinity, but the flip side is it will make this more susceptible to oxidative attack. And also the methyl group, this methyl group here, destabilizes 
the proton or this hydrogen on that carbon, on the backbone carbon. So flexible polypropylene has had issues and continues to have issues in oxidative environments, particularly with chlorine in potable water, particularly when folded, where we have what is called oxidative stress cracking, and in low LSI water. All those factors conspire to actually cause oxidative embrittlement of polypropylene. Even though it's flexible polypropylene, it will oxidatively embrittle. And even the best additive packages today find it challenging in, in chlorinated environments. Now, it's not all bad news because this methyl group, as I said, separates the linear nature of the backbone, lowers the crystallinity, which makes the material highly flexible. It's still a polyolefin, so it's relatively inexpensive. It has outstanding puncture resistance, far better than HDPE and even LDPE. Excellent conformance to uneven subgrades. Lower uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, so you get smaller wrinkles and of lower amplitude, and lower frequency, I should say. And it resists stress cracking the traditional stress cracking that, that uh, afflicts high-density polyethylene, FPP is, is immune to that stress cracking. And with proper additive packages, it can give long life in exposed conditions. Uh, so it is, it's a very good membrane for um, yeah, uneven subgrade and where you may have differential settlement issues such as CAPS. Now, this is the reinforced version of flexible polypropylene. We now have a polyester scrim that's in, in between, which gives us better tear strength, um, but it can come at a price. The scrim is susceptible to wicking. It is susceptible on exposed edges to the ingress of moisture along the scrim, which can potentially can lead to hydrolysis of the scrim. And in hot and moist environments that will lead to scrim breakdown. Again, the system sensitive to chlorine oxidation and free radical attack. Also, because of its lower crystallinity, uh, flexible polypropylene and the reinforced polypropylene are susceptible to ingress of organics, what we call fog, fats, oil, and greases. So those are limitations. On the plus side, the flexibility means it can be prefabricated into large panels and seriously reducing the number of field welds. And as we all know, factory or workshop welds are higher quality than field welds because you can control the environmental conditions a lot better. Less contamination, less water, moisture issues, etc. So reinforced polypropylene has very low crystallinity, but is a very useful liner. We now move to a even more uh, amorphous polyolefin and it's ethylene vinylacetate. Because it, ha it lacks any crystallinity or, or very limited crystallinity, it is highly flexible. It's most flexible of all polyolefin liners. It's relatively inexpensive and it conforms beautifully to subgrades. Generally, though, it's not used in exposed applications. It's more suited for tank liners. It can be pre prefabricated into large folded panels because of its flexibility. It does not stress crack. It is, um, it's quite a remarkable material. We can see from the structure on the bottom right, the ethylene, or I should point out the acetate side branch here is very large and hence that destroys any crystallinity that the main chains would try and, try and have. Now, the side branch pushes down the melting point. Melting point, as we see on the, on the left here, is uh, as low as 90 degrees. It's a function of the vinyl acetate content, but it's quite low. So it wouldn't, wouldn't be sensible to use this in exposed applications, particularly in Australia, where surface temperatures can get up to 80 because the material will become very sticky. Even on rolls, it can become sticky to the point where it can block or auto adhere to itself. And I'd be cautious using this in potable water because with uh, the acetate side group, you can get both um, oxidation and degradation leading to that acetate 
coming off as acetic acid. So taste and odor issues can develop in potable water. And it has inferior mechanical properties to HDPE because it's very soft, very flexible. It tears relatively easily. Okay, now we're moving to the vinyls and notably PVC, which is the most, uh, most widespread vinyl polymer, certainly a commodity polymer, very cost effective, widely used in terms of um, a plasticized PVC, highly flexible, we can see from the structure, the chlorine atom is uh, on every second carbon. That pushes those backbone chains apart quite considerably. And it renders this polymer without any crystallinity. Because it has no crystallinity, it has plenty of amorphous uh, regions to accommodate plasticizer. And also because of its polarity, it will accommodate polar plasticizers such as phthalates. So plasticized PVC liners are generally phthalate plasticized. That's good in terms of giving it even more flexibility, making it very easy to install, making it very easy to weld. However, on the flip side, that plasticizer is migratory. It can be extracted, it can be leached. So it actually means that these polymers can embrittle over time as the plasticizer um, basically migrates away. Also has limited UV degradation un unless it has very specialized additives. Maximum surface temperature, uh, maximum use temperature only 60 degrees and it has a high coefficient of uh, thermal expansion so it will wrinkle. Um, it also has a low seam strength compared to HDPE. The weld strength is far lower than HDPE and also in the unreinforced form it has a low tear strength. So it has its application in, in pond liners, but it would not be suitable in, in a heavy duty application such as a mining environment. Uh, it does have very good chlorine resistance and notably PVC liners are used as pool liners. So we know the chlorine resistance is good. It actually has 58% chlorine in its structure already by weight and hence it's already chlorinated. Now PVC is often alloyed with a non-migratory plasticizer called uh, Alveloy, that's the trade name from DuPont, but it's generically known as a ketone ethylene ester. And you'll see that on the right hand side, KEE. -E. It has both ketone groups, ethylene groups and ester groups. So this solid plasticizer can modify PVC to become an alloy where the plasticizer is permanent. That's great news. Um, it also has good chemical resistance in terms of uh, the permanent plasticizer. However, it's still much lower than HDPE. It's particularly sensitive to certain solvents, ketones notably, and uh, therefore wouldn't, wouldn't have uh, good chemical resistance for organic solvents. However, it has excellent chemical resistance for um, aliphatic solvents such as petrol and diesel. So diesel uh, and gasoline uh, do not attack this, this polymer and hence it finds a lot of use in secondary containment bunds um, and also because of its uh, good chlorine resistance it's used as floating covers for potable water reservoirs. Because of its flexibility very easy to uh, fabricate and prefabricate very easy to install and also easy to repair. And again, with the proper additive packages, 20 year exposed lifetime is realistic. So it's a particularly nice material. Um, we have to always be worried when it's reinforced, ply adhesion may be an issue. Uh, and we also have to then think about the migration of liquids along the scrim through capillary action. Certainly the leading type of liner in this category is the XR5, which has a non-wicking scrim. Uh, but some other versions that I've seen, the scrim uh, wicking can be an issue and ply adhesion can be an issue. Now looking at the chemical resistance of uh, PVC EIA or these alveloids, we can see that on the right hand side here. 
it's chemically attacked by many of the solvents that HDPE is resistant to. However, it's almost the inverse. The two or three chemicals that attack HDPE, notably diesel, xylene, toluene, um, sorry, notably the gasoline and the diesel, which are both obviously hydrocarbons, they absorb into HDPE, but they do not attack PVC EIA because of its polarity. So basically diesel and gasoline are nonpolar and there's no compatibility or affinity with PVC EIA, which is quite polar. So hence it's used in hydrocarbon storage bunding. Brings us to the next category on the right, uh, the, the next column, I should say. Uh, and these are the urethanes. And the first one here is what we call TPU, thermoplastic urethane. So it's not a thermoset, it's still a thermoplastic. It's highly flexible. It's not plasticized with any additives. So there's no plasticizer loss, no phthalates, no leaching over time. It has intrinsic flexibility. It conforms much better than poly those uh, high density polyethylenes to, to uneven subgrade, can handle differential settlement, and has excellent resistance to petroleum hydrocarbons, just like the PVC EIA. However, it has poor resistance to aromatic solvents and also poor resistance to strong acids and bases. So this wouldn't be recommended in a mining application where you would have an acidic leachate or in uh, where you'd have uh, perhaps in red mud storage where you have an alkaline material, uh, alkaline um, uh, red mud because it will be broken down either via hydrolysis or via chemical attack. So chemical resistance is limited. It has a urethane backbone, as we can see there, which is, is reactive in certain chemical environments. In terms of its heat stability, it can be used up to about 60 degrees, but beyond that, it softens very readily because we reach what's called a glass transition temperature. Um, and that starts at cl close to 95 degrees. And that means the hard segments, which are pseudo crosslinks, start to break down. And so the material really doesn't have any, any, any uh, thermal heat resistance for hot applications. And of course, this is available uh, in reinforced uh, form. You can see on the left there, large panels can be prefabricated so it makes it, uh, makes it very good for tanks, um, tank liners, also bladders, and also for gasoline storage, diesel storage. Uh, it's used in military applications for those, for those, uh, for those uh, fuel storage uh, containers. The next urethane is, is a uh, polyurea. And the structures shown on the bottom right here, we have these effectively ketone groups, and we have this urea structure. Now, it's a very flexible material, but it's also very tough. There's a lot of hydrogen bonding between these chains, between the ketone and, and, the, and the proton on, on the, the, the amine there. So what we end up with is very strong intermolecular chain bonding, and that gives very, a very, very tough liner. Now these liners are usually sprayed on a non-woven geotextile support and they can be sprayed both pre-sprayed in, in a factory or they can be um, sprayed in the field. Uh, spraying in the field is not trivial. You need to wear a, effectively a space suit, respirator. Um, the material cures, it cross links. Curing time is an amazing 30 seconds. So you don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to make a mistake. It cures almost immediately. It's a very durable coating in terms of its uh, ability to withhandle uh, abuse and its cross-link structure resists oxidative attack. And we can see from the symbol on the top left here, it has no melting point and it has a density slightly higher than one. On the negative side, 
its chemical resistance is far lower than HDPE. In particular, it has poor resistance to strong acids and bases, also poor resistance to aromatic solvents. And because of the ketone structure in its backbone, it has poor resistance to alcohol and ketones. And it's relatively expensive. So it may be used in tank lining or in specific um, effluent storage applications, uh, but not for chemical storage because of those limitations with chemical resistance. Moving further along to the right, we're now in, our, in the thermoset uh, area and we're looking at the rubbers. Of course, rubbers, these are cross-linked rubbers, so they, they, uh, they're chemically cross-linked. Once cross-linked, they don't melt. And the most commonly known one is EPDM. So no melting point, has a density of around 1.15. It has a polyolefin backbone, but it has um, reactive sites which allows it to cross-link. Makes it highly flexible. No crystallinity at all, which means it can be folded. It can be prefabricated in very large panels. And its, it's very strong point is high extensibility, 300%. Not to be confused with elongation at break. This is really practical elongation where it's still performing as a liner without any thinning. 300% is phenomenal compared to just 15% yield point for HDPE and about 30% yield elongation for linear low density. That means it can be used in applications where there is massive differential settlement, where there is massive uneven subgrade. And in fact, it can handle subgrade, compacted subgrade of up to 50 mil, two inch. It has outstanding puncture resistance compared to uh, HDPE, uh, just phenomenal puncture resistance. And it has good dimensional stability. So lots of positives. And when reinforced, it has very good tear strength. But that's where there's a compromise. In the unreinforced form, tear strength is quite low. You can tear it by hand, particularly when notched. Um, the seams also have relatively low seam strength. They're almost peelable by hand. Um, you can't compare the weld strength with HDPE at all. However, when reinforced with a scrim liner, the tear strength is, is uh, considerable. And because it's cross-linked, it, um, it is difficult to weld in the field. Normally you need to use a special seaming tape, but there are grades, particularly from uh, Sweden, one from Trellenborg, which has a special coating, a fusion coating, which allows it to be fusion welded in the field or even in the factory. Uh, but seam strength is still on the low side. In terms of uh, its surface friction, it has a high friction angle with the ground, 27.5 uh, degrees, uh, which means it can be installed on slopes without sliding issues. So they're all positives. It's used for channel lining. It's used for uh, lagoons, um, impoundments. Uh, it's been used widely. Firestone are the main manufacturers in, in North America. Now, one thing I do have to point out, it has good resistance to oxidative attack. However, it's not immune from oxidative attack. And in the lower right, you can see it does undergo free radical oxidation. But because of its high carbon black loading, up to 20% or more, 30%, and because of its, the intrinsic radical scavenging ability of carbon black, free radical attack is not that severe. Uh, it doesn't rely on stabilizers like polyethylene, HDPE. So it, it has very good uh, longevity, even in exposed applications. But the, the big issue, the big, um, uh, positive here is its, its resistance to flex cracking and its resistance to deformation. It's far, far greater than, uh, than the polyethylenes. And I can uh, sort of exemplify that on the next slide. On the top left here, we have a stress cracking, sorry, a flex cracking test that's in progress. It's a video grab. And we've compared three materials here. This is actually taken from a YouTube video, which we've put online. 
And the HDPE has started tearing, as you can see from the yellow arrow, at about 100,000 cycles, flex cycles. The linear low density we find starts tearing at close to 830,000 flex cycles. This is cyclic fatigue now. Now we've run this test up to um, 15 million flex cycles with EPDM and no flex cracking has been observed. So it has almost infinite flex crack life, which is very important where the liner may be under, under a bending strain or bending stress, um, even in exposed applications where you have uh, day night thermal uh, variations and you have wrinkling and you have bending, wind gusting, there's a number of areas where uh, seams are under a bending stress and that's a cyclic stress. So EPDM is very resistive to flex cracking and that makes sense because it has no crystallinity. So there are no crystallites that are rubbing on each other. There are no uh, crystallites that are breaking down with that repetitive strain and, and, str and bending. In the lower image here, we, it's another video grab from one of our, uh, our tests. This is a multi-axial burst test, multi-axial elongation. And you'll see the test on the right here is EPDM unreinforced, of course, um, at the limit of its multi-axial strain, which is an impressive 222% as compared to maybe 15% for HDPE. So you can just imagine that in an application where you have very uneven subgrade, this liner will accommodate those strains extremely well without any risk of stress cracking and without any risk of fitting. Uh, ultimately, it will burst, but that's under extreme uh, multi-axial strain. Okay, now the other thermo set, which is notable in the geomembrane uh, uh, community, of course, is Hyperlon rubber. Hyperlon is based on chlorinated sulfonated polyethylene. Structure shown below in the middle here. We have polyethylene backbone, but we have repeat units of, poly, of PVC effectively, and we have repeat units with sulfonyl chloride, which allows it to crosslink. Now, because of the chemical nature, it's already chlorinated. It can't be chlorinated anymore, so it has excellent chlorine resistance. There's also limited sites for free radical attack because it's been modified extensively, so it's very resistant to thermal oxidation. Not only that, but they compound in an amazing 40 to 50% of functional fillers. So what you're left with is a heavy rubber. You'll note from its density, it's 1.47, so it's very dense. Uh, has no melting point because it's cross-linked and it's generally reinforced. We can see that from these images, courtesy of Layfield, the top image, we have the, EP, the Hyperlon um, installed as a liner in a reservoir here. And notable is the absence of folds and wrinkles, particularly well, well uh, conforming to the subgrade. And the lower image, we can see a floating cover um, on the same reservoir also made from Hyperlon or CSPE. But it has some issues rela relating to its res chemical resistance. It's not as good as HDPE. So in certain mining applications, it needs to be used in caut with caution, depending on the, uh, the nature of the liquors. It has a limited shelf life. Because it starts progressively cross-linking from manufacture, it needs to be fabricated and installed within six months of each other, particularly in hot and humid environments. So that advancing cross-linking is both a blessing. It means the material's becoming stronger or and tougher, but it also is a limitation in that it becomes harder and harder to weld and harder to repair over time. So it has an advancing cure mechanism. Another limitation is relatively expensive. And the, the reinforced grade, as with all reinforced liners, the scrim only has about 15% extension. So it has limited conform, conformance to subgrade uh, contours if scrim reinforced. Now the other issue with the scrim, as I pointed out earlier, 
Exposed scrim provides a pathway for ingress of moisture, liquids, liquors between the plies, which is something you don't want. So this is a, a limitation of, of this material. Uh, we found, uh, we've tested the material and we found that the, the scrim that's used often is non, is, sorry, is not non-wicking. And what that means is that these coupons have been immersed simply in a, in a liquid, in a aqueous dye solution. And over time, the dye has impregnated through the exposed edges and migrated along the coupon and you can see green staining. So this is a consequence of wicking and it is a limitation of this material. It means the edges have to be fully encapsulated and exposed edges are a, a weak point. Okay, moving further along, we across the table, we get to the hybrids. And uh, these are composite materials. Uh, the best known would be the bituminous geomembranes. So what we have here is we have bitumen, a modified bitumen. Uh, the structure of bitumen is shown on the bottom right here. Bitumen is a very unique molecule because it's effectively made up of lots of polycyclic rings uh, and, 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 and non-aromatic rings, but it creates a structure that is very resistant to oxidation. It's almost an antioxidant in itself. So it has outstanding UV resistance and outstanding oxidative resistance, hence it's used in roads. To make it elastomeric and to give it better sealing characteristics, these BGM liners have been modified with this compound below, which is styrene, butadiene, known as SBS, or SBR. It's a styrene butadiene um, polymer. And that gives a material which is very damage tolerant. I should point out also that this bitumen and styrene modifier are uh, coated onto a non-woven uh, scrim uh, or a woven scrim. And that gives a liner which has very good damage tolerance. It's quite a thick liner has quite a high specific gravity, we can see here, 1.22, which means that it, uh, it has no issue with wind uplift and it doesn't float in, in water, so there's no ballasting required. It also has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. And looking at these pictures on the left, the top picture here, we can see wrinkles, this is HDPE. We can also see evidence of wind uplift and some probably trampolining. Whereas the image on the bottom, uh, we have very good conformance with the subgrade. The line is very flat. No wind uplift is possible there. And, um, and also wrinkling is, is non-existent effectively. And that's because of the nature of this bitumen modified uh, coating. It also can be installed at very low temperatures because it's not crystalline. It's not brittle. It can be installed at minus 40 or even lower. And it also has indefinite life in exposed applications. There's reports of uh, bituminous type material still surviving from the Roman Empire. So we're talking 2000 years. So it's amazing in terms of its uh, in inherent stability. In terms of some of the limitations, well, it has inferior chemical resistance to HDPE. It's relatively expensive to HDPE, although not more expensive than some other materials. Um, the seam strength is fairly low compared to HDPE. And where the seams are made, because it's made with a flame torch, the heating is done with a flame torch, care has to be taken that both the root barrier and the, um, the scrim or the reinforcement are not adversely affected by the, the seaming. Otherwise you can get root penetration. I've seen evidence where on the seams, certain roots can penetrate um, because of the, there's no barrier to those to the roots. But overall, a very robust material. Uh, it can be installed on compacted 50 millimeter subgrade, which uh, reduces site preparation costs. And also it has very good ability to handle installation traffic. You can drive on it, you can walk on it. 
Therefore, it's often used as the bottom liner in a dual line facility in a landfill, for example, the bottom liner being uh, BGM and the top liner being HDPE. Another one of the hybrids in that same group, um, we're dealing now with a composite which is cementitious, uh, a geosynthetic cementitious composite. What we have here is effectively a non-woven geotextile, uh, which has between it, between the two layers of non-woven geotextile, or sorry, between the geotextile and the backing, we have cement. And that cement can hydrate in situ. Now generally these materials, they're quite new, but they, they generally have a PVC or a PVC, PVC or a PE film bonded to the underside to allow it to hydrate from one side. And as the cement hydrates, it produces effectively a uh, concrete, concrete um, material, which is a reinforced concrete. Now, it has very good damage tolerance when, when hydrated, and it can be used uh, as a bund liner, as a slope liner. However, concrete has low tensile strength. So this material does have a lower tensile strength than, than other geo membranes, and also uh, bending strength under strain is not great. So there are a couple of the limitations. But on the plus side, it has extreme UV stability. It also has excellent heat stability, can be used at high temperature applications. It's faster to install than, uh, than, than concrete, than regular concrete. And it also has very high compressive strength because of the concrete, as, as long as it's fully supported. So you have the best of both worlds. You have the barrier properties of a uh, PVC or a polyethylene, but with the compressive strength of concrete. In terms of limitations, well, chemical resistance is lower than HDPE. It's at the very expensive end of the scale, about 70 US, sorry, Australian dollars per square meter. And the rolls have limited width. I think the maximum roll width at the moment is only five meters and, and some are lower than that. So that means a lot of uh, seams and a lot of overlaps to, to, to weld or seam. It's difficult to keep the weld overlaps clean. You can imagine as the, as the cement is falling out and the binder is falling out, these overlaps are going to be difficult to, uh, to maintain a contamination free overlap for, for welding. And also it's a relatively new material, so not much is known about the longer term effects of embrittlement of the PVC uh, on, on how the material will perform in the, in the long term once the, the polymer layer is potentially degraded. You can see the image here, the, the, uh, the installer is actually spraying water onto the, onto the, um, on the canvas or the cloth in order to hydrate it in situ. Okay, here we have some applications showing uh, where these cementitious composites can be readily used. So steep slope protection works very well. Obviously it's pinned as well. Uh, cushioning under, under culverts and roads and under rail. Slope protection, ditch lining, drainage channels, dam reinforcement, and even um, reservoir lining. So there's a number of applications for this material and it's very robust once fully hydrated. Now we're moving to the extreme right of the periodic table of geomembranes. We're into the column which is equivalent to the, the inert gases. And what we have here are the inert membranes or the inert liners. Of course, the notable one is Teflon, polytetrafluoroethylene. You can see from the structure in the bottom right, its chemical repeat unit is identical to that of polyethylene, except that the hydrogen atoms in polyethylene have been re replaced with fluorine atoms. And that effectively sheets the backbone from chemical attack. So there is no known chemical that will attack poly, uh, polytetrafluoroethylene. Uh, it's, it's effectively resistant to all, all chemicals. Uh, it's also very heat resistant. We can see from the uh, symbol over here, its melting point is 327 degrees 
which is extremely high, uh, some 200 degrees higher than that of polyethylene. And its density is very high because fluorine is, is a dense element and um, density 2.2, so it's, it's quite heavy material. And because of the fluorination process, uh, it's very expensive. It's about $50 a square meter, but it has exceptional properties. So would you, you would use this where no other liner would, would work. Outstanding chemical resistance, you would use it for harsh chemicals in mining uh, or in industry. Exceptional temperature resistance, as I said, 200 degrees more than polyethylene. Very high flexibility because it's a quite a thin liner. So the flexibility is very high. No issues with stress cracking. This particular membrane, uh, this one called cross film, is reinforced, but it's reinforced with filaments also made from Teflon. So it's 100% Teflon, 100% PTFE, and there is no weak point in its backbone for chemical attack. No oxidative attack, no chemical attack. It sort of resists all, all chemical exposure. So in terms of uh, containment of hot and acidic mining liquids, it would be the material of choice. And the realistic lifetime, even in exposed applications, is hundreds and hundreds of years, almost indefinite. Uh, probably it would be susceptible to mechanical damage before any uh, degradation uh, phenomena would occur to this material. Of course, cost is a barrier. And at the moment, there's only two suppliers worldwide. So limited availability um, in term, uh, because of, uh, of the two suppliers. But also, that would also mean that it's, uh, there's less uh, competitors and hence the price is higher. Now, related to this uh, polymer, sorry, I'll take you to this slide first. Those chemicals we looked at earlier, which attack HDPE in some cases, and alveloy PVC in others, you'll note that none of those chemicals, even 50% sulfuric acid, even 50% nitric acid, they have absolutely no effect on PTFE, nor do these um, aromatic solvents, toluene, xylene, uh, benzene, no effect. So hence it's the, the king of uh, membranes in terms of chemical resistance and it's deserving of, uh, of its status of being inert, an inert uh, liner. Now related to PV, uh, polytetrafluoroethylene is PVDF polyvinylidene difluoride. We can see from the structure, uh, similar to polyethylene again, except on one carbon, both hydrogens have been replaced with fluorines in every repeat unit. So this gives us a few advantages. One is melt processability. It's far more melt processable than Teflon, easier to extrude. Um, it also allows uh, a lower density, sorry, a lower density and has a lower melting point. And that, that's helpful in terms of processability. Um, and still it's high enough to be resistant to uh, most uh, processes in mining and in, and in, in uh, chemical industry. Uh, not affected by sunlight or UV at all. Uh, meets food, food uh, safe requirements, totally safe for potable water and for, for food. Um, the reinforced version, PVDR, comes with encapsulated edges because again, the scrim is always susceptible to ingress, so the, the scrim has to be protected. But it's resistant to all acids, solvents and fuels. Now, there is one exception. It is attacked by ketones. And um, PVDF is, is actually produced as also a surface coating where it's dissolved in, in ketones. But that is its one Achilles heel, is this ketone attack. Its life is again hundreds and hundreds of years uh, without the need for additives. No antioxidants, no stabilizers, and hence there's no issue with, uh, with additive leaching because there are no additives. It's a pure material, and hence the reason it's inert and the reason it meets the, uh, the food grade uh, legislation, as well as potable water requirements. Um, I should point out there is one other form of attack, which is very unusual, but we've seen it. In low LSI water, this low Langelier saturation water, this water is devoid of all minerals, practically all minerals. 
So it has a very, very low conductivity and it, the water is wanting to pull anything out of the polymer it can and it can actually remove uh, HF. It can remove hydrogen fluoride from the backbone of PVDF, we've seen it happen, and the material will go from being white in colour to being black or various shades of black, various shades of, of, of uh, grey and then full black. And that's loss of hydro, hydro fluor, hydrogen fluoride leading to unsaturation in the backbone. Now we've only seen that in a very rare number of cases with very low LSI water and particularly in, uh, in semiconductor processing where they use ultra, ultra purity water uh, for the semiconductor manufacture. So that brings me to the end of the, uh, this, this webinar. I, I would like to say that there is a lot more reading to be had in, in this book on geomembranes that I produced. All the membranes we, we spoke about are detailed in this book in terms of their uh, properties, uh, structure property relationships and limitations. And if you'd like a copy of this, just contact me. I can, I can organize that. Uh, other than that, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to field questions and I'll endeavor to get back to uh, the CIMAC. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, not sure if you can make Mike Amspec a uh, host so he can start his presentation. Otherwise, just make me a host. My name is in the panelists section, panelists tab. Maybe up here. Do I invite you? Is that how I bring you in or? Uh, just Where's the tab? So go participants down at the bottom. There's a an icon yes. for participants. Yep. And then there's a tab for panelists. Ah, yes, I see it. Yep. And then make me promote to, oh, sorry, make house. There should be an option for that. No, I don't see that, unfortunately. No. So if you hover on my name, yeah, uh, there's a more button that appears. Well, I see the three dots, which says save chat. Allow attendees to chat with no one, all panelists, and all panelists and attendees. Yeah. What happens when you hover mouse over my name? Nothing. I can type a message. Yeah, okay. Then the other option is go to the attendees tab. And then scroll down to find my cam spec. Oh, hang on. I see something here. Make host. Oh, no, I found it. Make yep. it pop. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. You've got it. Yep. All right. So next we go to Mike Amspec uh, from Autofield. I just need to make Mark a panelist. Hey, Mike. Oh, Sam, Mac, can you? Uh, I'll share my video. And share my screen. Yep. Yep. We can see that. What's up? And running. 
Well, thanks, everyone. I, I'm conscious of the time frame and the ability to talk to uh, John and get some questions for John. I don't interrupt it. Probably the, the major question is why Adafil GM membranes who functionally manufacture polyolefins, which uh, John described as a commodity. Uh, I'll tack it up with him. But uh, <laughs> the reason why we sponsor these events is this type of event is at the heart of GM membrane innovation. And, and Adafil yeah. believe they're at the heart of HDPE and polyolefin geomembrane innovation and there's huge developments happening in the Australian market and they're evidenced about the development of specifications. So what I'll go through this fairly quickly. I might even record a version uh, for you, CMAC, for the website just because we're time constrained. But my contact details are important. So we know HDPE evolution, it really began with GM13 in 1997. It's been updated every couple of years. The key points with GM13 is it identifies the formulation and identifies certain durability properties, um, particularly stress crack resistance, which has been elevated over time. It's now 500 hours. And it highlights standard OIT and HPOIT, but it's OR. So that's a very distinction from what's happening in the Australian market at the moment. Both short-term and oven age tests. So, so by moving towards performance type criteria, you start to have tests that take time, basically. UV resistance is deemed as critical. But what really GM13 states is it's a general application test. And John's highlighted repeatedly in the past, it doesn't consider immersion. So be very careful specifying GM13 with non-benign leachates. As your chemistry changes on site, consider upping those longevity properties. And in fact, the low costs of lifting durability values really make this redundant to critical applications. In Australia, the Vic EPA, BEPM in its current manifestation came out in 2010. Really, this is for solid waste landfill leachates. And so they identified that it needs to go beyond GM13 and, and really identified leachate or chemistry considerations for GM membranes. Particularly, it's the first document that I came across where they started to think about geosynthetic inputs um, with geotextiles. So we're no longer considering just a polypropylene geotextile. We're considering some of the inputs. And I would say that the weakness in geosynthetic research historically has been understanding the inputs and, and geomembranes at the forefront of this, but geotextiles need to be considered. Uh, BEPM GCLs, you actually need to put additives in your GCL to actually reach the actual BEPM guidelines. And there's a criteria in there for how these additives need to be analyzed. But it's the first document that really starts to analyze these formula inputs and particularly with geomembranes, it's formulation. So, and it starts to consider things outside of the material, the geomembrane material. So site-specific durability considerations like temperature, stress, and puncture. And a key, two key differences that recommends both standard OIT and HPOIT to identify different packages, short-term, both short-term and oven aged. And it also recommends CQA for properties. And, and GRI, GM13 is an MQC document. Now we're starting to sample and test from site. So as the properties evolve of these GMs, then the testing gets longer and the testing only starts when you send samples from site, which introduces huge ramifications. Then now we're seeing the evolution in Australia in critical applications to project specific GM membranes. And I highlighted this because John is at the heart of what's happening here. For particularly challenging sites, I really observe them regularly from around 2010 really prevalent since coal seam gas and key mining tailings applications. And, and what you're doing is you're looking at site-specific chemical immersion and you're looking at site-specific durability considerations. You're trying to link the two, temperature, stress and puncture. And what you find in the final product is extremely elevated stress crack resistance properties. And then you get site-specific and elevated standard IIT and HPIT, uh, both short-term and oven-aged. And you have large jobs which demand CQA from site. So you've got, again, this sample from site being sent to a lab and the time frame and the risk that comes with it. And this is where you really need to engage both designer and polymer expertise. And I've just highlighted on the right what happens to stage A degradation of a GM13 product when you lift the temperature to 50 degrees and you elevate the pH. You can see you're starting to look at antioxidant depletion sort of under 10 years, which is unacceptable in these type of environments. And so what are, what are the commercial implications of this immersion testing? Well, 
first the client asks, how much time do I have? What will it cost? Uh, what geomembrane formulation do I need to test, test to begin with? How do I get samples? I mean, the manufacturer has to make for a specific project to, to conceivably actually supply samples for testing. What test, what properties do I measure? And how long is long enough? And this is where John, engagement with John and others comes in, where, you know, what time frame are we doing this immersion testing? So what properties do I write in the specification? And, and does it correlate to site and environmental factors? This is an immersion test. How do we correlate to this to the environment? And, and the final one really is, does a small sample represent massive quantities on site? I mean, are you ensuring this, this product consistency? Um, and, and what these immersion testing results in is elevated durability measures for stress crack, for UV, elevated specific standard OIT and HPIT. Um, and, and really what happens is you need specific resins, you need specific additives, so you end up with a higher production risk for a manufacturer, you get a higher failure and rejection risk, and obviously you've got tests taking longer because the product performs longer in standard tests. So you get this perfect storm emerging if you don't address it. And, and CQA from site, I mean, Bethel Malone uh, testing really is, you're getting a minimum 120 days from site after the product is delivered. So how can you circumvent that? Or at least how can you eliminate the client's risk who's dependent on a, on a final result? It's often the materials that determine the actual construction program, which is you know, not really the intent, but a huge risk of last minute rejection, test results failure, fail. So, so how is Adafield sort of overcoming these challenges? And, and one of the key things we do is we do replicate the same flat dye manufacturing technique at all factories, Spain, Dubai, and the US. And what that allows us to do is manufacture the same product and replicate it worldwide. We replicate the technologies. You can choose to supply bauxite projects around the world because the, the end product is the same around the globe. So you're centralizing expertise, you're centralizing your technical library, and your actual case studies are translating to industries around the world. What we've also done is develop this one meter prototype line. And, and really the question is, how does that compare to the full scale line? And, and really it's about a thermal, thermal history um, question. So what we've done is extensive trials there to demonstrate that the one meter prototype does translate to the full scale lines at all factories. How do we solve elevated stress crack resistance? Well, that's an easy one relative for us because we only use really high quality stress crack resistant resins. We take our standard specs of 3,000 hours, which will exceed any, any project specs. So they're always terminated. They're always passing well in advance. So you can tick that one off almost immediately. But how do we, um, how do we solve specific SOIT and HPOIT? And, and I guess there's, um, you can try and circumvent it, but there's one answer for BEPM and it's just pass the values every time. Ensure that your product is sufficient with both, both types of additives that you're passing both tests consistently and a constant R&D focus, different formulations, project specific hows, antioxidants, et cetera. Solving the immersion testing challenges is a real challenge. So you've got to invest in internal immersion testing, inter internally obviously an R&D program, this ensures ongoing formulation development and we can provide recommendations to clients on critical sites, which is critical when you're choosing, you're screening your initial product to be to immersed. And an investment in independent R&D with the Excel Plas Labs is, is a key aspect of this as well. You need laboratory comparison, you need IP comparison. It's, a, it's important to share data and have independently evaluated data. So that's big on the program. Solving testing duration challenges is a huge one and the BEPM industry is at the heart of it. Um, independent factory CQA where it's allowed, particularly in the mining sphere we're doing this, where independent assessors can attend the factory, uh, a critical aspect. Um, but functionally what we're doing is we're trying to correlate short-term testing values to these long-term tests. What do I mean by that is, is oven aging for, uh, across the range of properties is a classic example. If you are replicating the same product and you're actually replicating the oven testing results, the client doesn't have to wait 90 days for the final result if you know how it's behaving during the progressive oven aging results. So if we can present data to how the material behaves over the short term, 
then it allows the client to understand their risk long term. They're not all sweating on a single result for OIT or HPIT after 90 days. Strain hardening is another area where we're correlating a one day test to a standard SCR test that might take 100 days, which is really an important development. And, and in, in the end, what does this facilitate? Well, it facilitates replicable worldwide specific project specific and industry specific HDPE formulations. And that would be what Adafil consider their badge of honor, if you like. So we call it bulk site residual disposal, residue disposal area partnerships, red mud jobs, where we replicate this program. The site liquors are similar. We try and test with the, synthesis, with, with the actual site liquor, but there's always the opportunity to synthesize. And here are some projects over a large scale, but it requires a significant R&D investment. Three labs, accredited, independent lab testing, the small scale line like GM machine is utilized to try and create formulations to bespoke. Um, we do the immersion and synthesized end site liquors, different concentration, elevated temperatures and elevated range of temperatures to establish arrhenius durability predictions which allows us to review and modify key formulation additives. So you're providing pr project specific solutions. So in conclusion, I would suggest that you know, while John describes the polyolefin range as, as, as commodity based, there's still some significant innovation uh, in, happening in this sphere. And John's well aware of this, he's at the heart of it. So just thank you all for your time. I've tried to go on through that quickly. Safe containment now has a new meaning, obviously with COVID, so stay healthy. And uh, my contact details are at bottom and Adafil Australia is Eduardo's email is there on site um, at the top. So, so thanks everyone for your time. Thanks, Mark. Um, so we basically went over time. So I just uh, probably ask John uh, maybe one or two questions um, on the live session and then we leave the rest of them for uh, email um, written responses back to the uh, people who um, asked the questions. Uh, the question is, does the sti distilled water have uh, low LSI, John? Um, that's one question. Okay, so LSI is the ability of the water to dissolve carbonate. So if the water is, um, devoid of any carbonates, then it will want to dissolve carbonate. That's the definition of LSI. So yes, distilled water will be low LSI, but how low? So if we're talking dangerously low, it's minus two to minus four, and distilled water is not near that. Distilled water might be around zero. So we're talking about RO water that has a minus two to minus four LSI, and in my experience, I've only seen that um, on mining sites where they demineralize the water because they use the water as a coolant for the smelter jacket where they don't want any hard water deposits. So it's an extreme case. Uh, another question, what's the difference between PTFE and EPTFE? Is there any application in Australia? Okay, we don't see e e ETFE in liners. We do see it in rotor molding. We see it in pipes. So the difference is uh, there's a, an ethylene, more ethylene in the ETFE. PTFE is 100% Teflon. It's just a carbon backbone with fluorine atoms flanking every carbon. So it has the best chemical resistance, but it's also the hardest to process. ETFE is more melt processable like PVDF, uh, it has better chemical resistance than PVDF, but not as good as, as PTFE. And last question before we close out, uh, what are the advantages of uh, metallocene LLDPE against LLDPE? Okay, so metallocene refers to the catalyst by which the polymer is made. With metallocene catalysts, the catalyst is constrained and by, by constrained, it's, the analogy is a pearl in a clamshell. So the ethylene monomer can come in to reach the catalyst, which is the pearl, in only one direction and leave in one direction. So you end up with very 
regular chains. So the molecular weight distribution is very narrow, meaning all chains have effectively the same molecular weight. That's one advantage. So narrow, uh, narrow uh, molecular weight distribution. The second advantage is that you can design where the co-monomer, where the branches are on the molecular weight curve. And you saw from those PERT resins, there was more co-monomer in the higher molecular weight tail or in the higher molecular weight peak of the bimodal distribution. That is a, a function of the metallocene chemistry, which means you can design the architecture of the polyethylene to give it better heat stability and give it better uh, puncture resistance. So that, that's the metallocene uh, definition. Yep. All right. Thanks a lot, John and Mike. Uh, both of you, very interesting presentations. And um, thank you to all of our attendees today. Um, again, this um, webinar was recorded, so we will upload it to our website within a couple of days. And you can um, find links on the website uh, very soon. Thanks for um, attending. And thanks again, John and Mark. And uh, we we'll see you in our next webinar, which is going to be next month in uh, June 2020. See you. Perfect. Thanks, guys. See you, Matt. Thanks, All John. Best. Thank you.